Welcome, everybody, to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast. And I'm your host, Olivia Fierro. And, uh, you know, Memorial Day weekend kicking off the start of summer. And hopefully that will mean a little vacation time, maybe road trip or uh, a long flight and a little more time to read. And it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, fluffy beach reads. Um, We want some stuff with heart and with some substance. So a little later, Margaret is going to join me and we're going to be talking in particular about some books that hit notes on grief that resonated uh, with us and in particular with her right now. But we want to talk about a really fantastic book that I think you're going to want to add to your TBR for the summer. It is Yerba Buena. Um, I'm not alone in this. Washington Post, Vulture, Book Riot, naming it one of the most anticipated books of the year, not just the summer, of the year. So I'm happy to uh, say that our author, Nina LaCour, is joining us this morning, or this I shouldn't say this morning. That's a habit from the morning show lifestyle. That's what happens when you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning. You never know what time it is. Joining us now uh, to talk about uh, this book, uh, Nina, you already have published uh, many best-selling young adult fiction novels, and you are the author of also, congratulations, a children's book, Mama and Mommy and Me in the Middle. That is a beautiful title. Uh, But you are here to talk about Yerba Buena, which is – a departure for you, but I understand this was a book a long time in the making. Yes, and thank you so much for having me on. I'm so thrilled to be here with you. I started writing your book many, many years ago, and it was a book that I was very excited to write, and I really was drawn to these characters and these situations, but I didn't know how to tell their story. It took me a lot of years to figure out exactly what their stories would be and how they would intersect. And so I really started writing it in earnest um, during like the early time of the pandemic when most of us were staying at home. And that's when I just dove into it and spent a long time working on it and, and finally saw what it was meant to be all of those years. Well, and that doesn't surprise me because there is, it's just, uh, it's, it's steeped in the sense of kind of lostness, for lack of a better word, that we were all experiencing during that t- that time period, that um, untethered kind of um, uh, listlessness and, and sadness that kind of loomed large over, over our lives. And that's very much um, a part of these pages and these characters and, and, and their desire for connection, but the struggle uh, to find it. And also, I would imagine that it takes a little life experience to craft these characters. And I wouldn't think that uh, you, 15 years ago at the age of 15, would um, be able to, to get here in the complexity that you, you've got to live a a little bit and you've got to hurt a lot I think to be able to create fictional characters like this that that read so real so will you um talk about what the book is about for the listeners who who are going to be new to your Buena. and I find it very hard to describe even though I connected very well with it so so what was your pitch when you were talking to a publisher and then introduce us to the two ladies that are in the center of this Okay, yes. It is a difficult book to describe. Actually, my favorite way of describing it came from an early reader who said that it was a love story nestled within two coming-of-age stories. And I think that is kind of the perfect way to describe it. So it is about two young women. Um, One of them, Sarah, is from Northern California, and the other, Emily, is from Southern California. And we follow them from their teen years into, you know, through their 20s and uh, until they're around 30 years old. So it it spans quite a few years. And it is a story of each of them kind of um, coming to terms with their family trauma and these big life events that have shaped them. And along the way, their paths intersect. And um, when they first meet, they really aren't ready to be in a relationship yet, although they're very attracted to each other from the beginning. They just have very complicated lives at that time. And so it's about how they kind of weave in and out of one another's lives, but as their own lives are are really taking shape. And I really wanted to get into that, the messiness of the twenties. Like when, when you're in your twenties and you're figuring things out and you're looking at what your, you, your past used to be like and what you might want out of your life. And so I, I got to get really deep into, into that. Well, and that's a very real um, and palpable 
memory, I mean, from long ago, maybe, um, <laughs> but of that, of that, yeah, you are still becoming you. You think you know what you want. You think that that relationships or passion or connection is, is in one moment, it's everything. And then in the other moment, you realize you simply don't have the ability to, to bring somebody else into your life as you don't even know uh, what you want to define your own life and your own identity to be. And so both of these women are struggling in, in these spaces and, and have to have a lot of growth on their own to, to come back to grow together. Um, in particular, Sarah, she has got a, and, and I think one of the elements that surprised me the most about the book was a, a really tragic beginning. Um, so talk about how her stories, I mean, this is a very unique character. I mean, you say coming of age story, but but this is not the type of experience that we see a lot of, of young women on the page have to go through that would, would cause them to start their, you need, lead them to start a very difficult life on their own um, at the age of 16. Yeah, so Sarah is from uh, a place called that we call the Russian River here in California. I'm in San Francisco, so it's just about an hour and a half of a drive away from San Francisco. There's this place called the Russian River in a town called Guerneville. And it's an incredibly beautiful town in terms of the nature. Like it's the redwood forests and the river and, you know, orchards. It's just very, very beautiful. And it also has a lot of poverty and a lot of drugs. And so there's a big disconnect between the kind of weekender vibe of the place where the tourists come from the city, spend a beautiful weekend in nature, and a lot of the people who live there and have lived there for generations and have really struggled with poverty and um, you know all of the, the issues that, that go along with it. So Sarah is very much a product of her place. Like she is orphaned already. Well, her mother has died already by the beginning of the novel. She has a father who's largely absent and she learns more about him as the novel progresses, but he really is not able to connect to his children and she has a little brother named Spencer who she cares for and loves and who is kind of her reason for, you know, going home every night and getting up in the morning and going to school. She really takes on this parenting role of him. But she also has a secret girlfriend named Annie and very early on in the novel. So it's a little bit of a spoiler, but, you know, I think it's it's clear enough that bad things are going to happen. Um, Annie dies in this mysterious and tragic way early on in the novel. And there are other kind of terrible things that happen to Sarah on this very, very bad day. And it causes her to run away from home and to head to Los Angeles. And so she's dealing with the trauma of her lost mother and her girlfriend who was her first love and this other thing that I don't want to spoil, but that is yeah. a very traumatic um, event and betrayal of, of trust of an adult in her life that she trusted. And so she is really on her own heartbroken, but also um, needs to tap into this great inner strength in order to make it to Los Angeles and to start a life there at 16 years old with nobody by her side, yeah. except this, this other teen runaway friend. <laughs> so it starts in this very, very sad place. And I actually struggled with that a little bit in the writing of the book, because I don't, I see it as a book with a lot of sadness, but it's also a book with so much joy and beauty and connection and growth. And so um, I worried a bit about starting it in such a sad place, but then then I realized it's also a story about like very hard won success and um, fulfillment. And it starts from this, this very difficult, painful place and it blossoms into something that I hope is very gratifying for a reader. So I realized I needed to start, you know, down in that dark, difficult stuff before letting her climb her way out of it. Uh, her journey is certainly a, a tremendous one. And of course, you're very invested in, in somebody who is experiencing so much so early in life and um and the way that grief and and loss and isolation and just sort of that that abandonment um both intentional abandonment and abandonment um that can't be controlled uh, just by death is is such a is so profoundly shaping that all of the challenges that she encounters as we hope to see, you know, happiness and, and connection and love and, and support and healthy relationships, of course, is, these are big 
big hurdles to clear and um, very much uh, for the reader. I mean, you're, you're completely invested in God, this girl, <laughs> this woman just needs, she needs, she needs a break and she needs things to start lining up uh, um, in, in a way that's going to allow for her success. And she's, she certainly has earned it. So I, I thought it was a, a very, but it was, it was very surprising to me too, because I, I just, you know, I start, I started listening to it on audio, which was phenomenal. And it just, um, the, the heaviness at first really took me and shook me, um, and then it really does take the the reader on on a phenomenal journey. Um, and, and a very interesting contrast to her is Emily, who is uh, seemingly has everything at her fingertips, and she is just sort of that person that everybody knows or maybe has been. <laughs> who I love is it is she in year number six or seven of pursuing her undergrad. <laughs> I think, I think it's, I think she goes into year seven. Okay. But yeah, but of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Emily has a much different family and she also has been, her family has been touched by drug addiction, just as Sarah's has. You know, Sarah's mother dies from complications with heroin use. Emily's sister Colette has an overdose early on in the book and in Emily's teen years. And though, you know, Emily herself doesn't grapple with these addiction issues, though her family life is very comfortable and this nice Southern California house with the two parents, you know, two professional working parents and all of that, um, she is really shaped by her her role in relation to her sister. She's the younger sister. She idolizes her sister. Her sister is this big personality who's supposed to go far. And Emily is this quiet one who, in her mind, is supposed to kind of stay still and stay small and stay quiet and not live a big life, though, like the life that her sister was supposed to live. And so she finds herself very confined by her role in the family. And that leads her to be really stuck and get in these relationships that are not a good idea to be in and to just um, sort of blend into whatever situation she finds herself in. And she does a good job and, you know, she shows up and she's pretty and she, you know, gives the people what they want, but she doesn't really know what she wants herself. And so her journey is one of really coming into herself and realizing what it is that she truly wants and then how, how to talk about how to fight for it and to take action and do it. So that was a very gratifying story line to write for me to see somebody who's really floundering for a long time and just kind of allow myself to get wrapped up in what that's like. I think many of us, as you said, have had these experiences in our own lives or have watched friends go through similar situations and so she she does feel quite familiar yeah definitely very relatable and i i just i i think what you did a really beautiful job of is is presenting two whole people who we're all so different and, and somebody can go through a profound tragedy and have the resilience to 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 forge ahead uh, when it would make somebody else crumble and and somebody else can go through what other people would think is you know minor challenges but you have a, a of the fragility or or you know a sense of of empathy that overwhelms you too much with the concerns of, of, of the happiness of others and that can be debilitating. And those things are both real and both powerful. Um, and not everybody needs to be, you know, have, have been, you know, at the focal point of tremendous tragedy to struggle with believing that they deserve happiness. You put that so beautifully. <laughs> I completely agree. And yeah, it was interesting to explore that in the book and to figure out how to give each of these women their own equal weight in the novel and and to care about them equally, even though their situations have been so incredibly different and their opportunities have been so different. And that was a good exercise for me in empathy and in really taking, you know, everyone struggles very seriously yeah. and treating them with as much care as I could. Also, uh, a lot of attention is paid to our environments in this book. So we talked a little bit about um, the, the roots of, of the uh, kind of wine country, small town that is idyllic for somebody who has a lot of money and can and buy a beautiful cabin and enjoy uh, weekends away with, with great food and wine. A very different picture for people who are struggling economically, who you know don't have the advantages, who are resentful of that, who, who also have to like, ride or die on a tourism economy but hate tourists at the same time. 
time. I mean, th- and that's it. That's that's played out all across the country in in places um, all over. But then the setting of Los Angeles, and uh, I grew up in LA, so you know all of that that feel, and also you know the the places the and stepping into bar culture and. Um, as things are the aesthetics of Hollywood and West Los Angeles and all of that um, is very important and very, um, very much a, a, another character, I felt like, on, on the page of this book. Yeah, I absolutely, I love all of those things so much. You know, shamelessly, I just, I love beauty. I love good food. I love gorgeous restaurants. I love cocktails. Like, I just, I love it all. I love beautiful houses. And so I wanted to bring in as much beauty as I could, especially in the sense of how we create our own lives and how we choose to craft our own lives and to um, the, just that we have the power to make our lives beautiful if we want to. And so and when we're, when I'm looking at all of this very painful, heavy stuff, you know, fraught sibling relationships, you know, loss, you know, grieving parents, all sorts of things like that. Um, when I'm spending time there to also spend time making the external world really, really beautiful can be such a comfort to the characters and just add this contrast that I think can be very special in books and films and TV shows when we see pain and we also see beauty and we remember how they interact with each other and how we can take comfort in creating beautiful things or experiencing beautiful things and that it does not have to be fancy. Like there are these elegant restaurants in the book but there are also just like very, very tiny moments and tiny, beautiful things as well. Like one scene that I really love in the book is when Sarah is getting her first apartment and the girl who's least she's taking over, she opens the fridge and she takes out this bottle of Lille and she pours her just like a tiny little sip of this like beautiful little alcohol. And Sarah sees it and feels that it's very special and takes a sip. And this isn't, you know, a fancy drink. It's not a fancy bar. It's like a little studio apartment, but it in that moment is like the most beautiful thing in the world. I assume that you, well, you mentioned, okay, a love of food. And, and I know I read in your bio, you uh, love gardening, which which kind of <laughs> is also a, a tie-in here throughout uh, the themes of the book. Yeah, I, there's got to be, please say, a cocktail recipe that's, that's, that's going to be published in association with promoting this book, right? There is, there is, yes. So I am very lucky. I am not a, you know, mixologist myself at all, but my wife is a wonderful cocktail maker. And so, especially since we couldn't go anywhere when I was writing this book, we were stuck inside our, our apartment in San Francisco. She would, I'd be writing in the evenings and she would bring me a cocktail and it felt for a moment like I was in a special restaurant or bar and I got to drink this beautiful thing. And so I, it definitely influenced the, the drinks in the book. And then I would ask her questions like, what would go well in a cocktail that would be called a yerba buena? Like what would go well with some mint and what would be green and all of this? And she developed a recipe for me. So we tested them out and they're delicious. So there is a, a yerba buena recipe. And there's also a recipe for a mocktail which um, features in the dinner party scene that's later in the book because the book does um, deal with issues of addiction. And I did want to explore that a little bit because I both love cocktails and, you know, enjoying a glass of wine now and then. And I also am very sensitive to people in my life who can't have alcohol who, you know, and so um, in the book also, they're very attuned to that and respectful of it. And so we also made a delicious mocktail recipe too. Yeah. I, I, the, the ode to I mean, giving you the honor of entertaining um, is you really, you show that you have a true appreciation for it, which is, I think the greatest thing to, to enjoy, you know, sometimes like, you know, we're not all necessarily good at it, but to enjoy those moments of knowing, okay, I put effort into, and I brought people into my home and they're, and they're happy. And there, there's something so incredible about that. Yeah, there really is. There is. And I have like, just how I had to grow as a writer in order to write this book from when I was very young and initially conceptualizing it. I also had to evolve in like what it means to be a good host and like how to create those really nice environments for people. 
And it has taken me a long time to learn that like just knowing what people love and like having those things on hand, having something simple to offer, not caring about perfection and instead just like making people feel welcomed and taken care of is such a gift. And so there's plenty of that in the book too, about just what it means to show somebody that you care for them through some small act of hospitality. Yes, I couldn't agree more. I know you do um, some teaching and you've hosted podcasts about your writing and, and, um, and, and so, and are teaching professionally and, and offering a, a variety of different courses. What do you, as, I mean, as readers, we, we, we worship books, right? We love books. And then we think, oh my gosh, you know, the, the people who can write, they're just magic. And, and that's a magic that's unattainable. So for somebody who thinks maybe this story will brew for 15 years, but, um, or, or maybe it's something that could go down on paper uh, right away. What's the biggest hurdle or the biggest mistake that you see people make that one thing that holds that holds them back i think people certain types of people have a tendency to feel like they're what they have to offer isn't big enough or important enough or significant and so they have this like beautiful little story and by little i don't mean trivial i just mean like intimate, personal, not flashy. Like they have this idea and they doubt themselves so much. And then they try to create like this flashier, bigger, you know, idea around it, or they worry that what they're doing isn't new or exciting. And so what I love to tell writers and just remind writers and also remind myself of all the time is that what makes a story really special is the way in which the writer sees the world and conveys it in, in this work of fiction. So it doesn't need to be a concept that's new because that's impossible. Like, <laughs> yeah. <can> be <laughs> but as long as like it's as like authentically them and as specific as possible, um, that's where that's where things get really exciting is when you're reading something and you feel like, oh, this person has a point of view and it doesn't have to be someone else's point of view. It's your own point of view. So I think all of that stuff is in is in you already, you know, whoever's listening to this, who's wanting to write, it's in you already. And it's just a matter of having the trust in yourself that you will be able to write a story that will matter to, to other people. Do you think in part, that's why I feel like so many really, really talented writers, they begin in the genre they, and they love and, and not, not, not begin to leave behind, but, but they publish and have success first in young adult fiction. Is there something that is just more tangible about that because you know you have that life experience and, and you're not trying to write this sweeping, you know, great American novel that's uh, 700 pages of... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I can, I can speak to my own experience with it, which is I went to grad school for creative writing and I actually, I, I applied and got in with a, um, a writing sample that had Sarah and Emily in it, had these Yerba Buena characters in it. That's like what I thought I was going to work on, but I was like 21 at the time. And I just wasn't ready to write a story about like women finding themselves and like becoming adults. I was still so young. And so I, instead shifted to writing YA because I felt like, oh, I know what it was like to be 16. Like, I remember that completely. I remember, you know, the swings that we, we would ditch school and go like swing in the park. And I remember like all of these things um, so vividly at that, at that time when I was in my early twenties, you know, my mid to late teens were so vivid and yet a little, a little distant. So I was able to have some perspective. And so I think that is, especially if people are writing when they're young, you know, those teen years are just so vivid. Um, so I think that's absolutely can be a great place to start. Will you tell me just a little bit about your children's book? I, I love to see, and we, we all know how important and, and the research and the science and everything says how important representation is. It, it matters. And in particular for little children to see families of all formations uh, represented in, in their books and, and be able to see themselves and their own families um, reflected. So, so what motivated your story? 
Yeah, well, um, my wife and I have a daughter. She's about to turn nine now. Um, and when she was little, it really was so hard to find books with two moms in, in them. I mean, there are so few, and especially like so few good ones that are just about life and not about like explaining something, <laughs> you know, explaining a family. So I wasn't quite sure. I knew I wanted to try to write a picture book. I wasn't sure what to write it about. And then I was teaching. I still do teach part-time at Hamlin University's program for writing for children and young adults, which takes place in Minnesota. It's a low residency program, which means that you know, the, the faculty and the students go twice a year for 10 days and they have this big residency and they have workshops and they learn so much and then everybody goes back home. And so it's a great job when you have little kids because you can be home all the time except for these two big trips. And so I was on one of those big trips. I was missing my daughter so much at the time and I knew she was missing me and I had written her little letters for each day I would be away and my wife was like gonna read them to her each morning. And, um, but that's, that's where the idea of the story came from. So it's about a little girl who stays home with her mama while her mommy is away on a work trip. And in the story, it's a one week long work trip. So it goes through the days of the week and everything that the little girl does with her mama while her mommy is away. And then eventually, of course, mommy comes back home and you expect it to be this big, like just completely joyous reunion. But actually the little girl is mad, you know, she's angry, <laughs> she's sad. She thinks about all the times that she's missed her mommy while she was away. And then, um, of course she forgives her and, they call <laughs> the bug and the girl is in the middle again and it feels cozy again. So it was really fun to write this story that was like, just about like, just, a, it's just a family, you know, it's just a work yep. trip mm -hmm. and it can be, you know, kids can identify with any, like whenever they're missing anybody or anything, it can be a good book to read for missing people or places or animals. And it can also just show kids a two mom family uh -huh. at the same time. Oh, that is so sweet. Yeah. And it's like, we're coming back, okay? So just don't, don't be so don't be so dramatic and don't hold a grudge. Yes, because <laughs> later on you're probably going to be wishing that we were gone anyway. So you know it's all it's all it's all good. Well, this has been absolutely delightful to speak to you. And um, the the book is the book is it, it really it really um, stayed with me. So it, my, my compliments to you for creating uh, th these characters and it's a it's a true journey. And I was very invested in where uh, everybody was headed and, and how this story would resolve. So thank you very much for uh, for speaking about some of what went into this and uh, and and for the book. Congratulations! Thank you so much for having me. It's been so wonderful to talk to you. Thank you, Nina Lacour. Your Babuena, a novel, is out May thirtieth. It is time now for a moment with Margaret. And Margaret, I just got done talking with Nina LaCour of Yerba Buena and talking kind of about all of the themes of, uh, you know, coming of age and love and loss and grief and trauma and people moving past all of that. And, you know, it's that kind of meaty, meaningful book that um, gives you a lot to think about after. Yeah. Um, we've, We've talked about grief and in its in its infinite stages, right? You know, we talked about an, um, one Italian summer, which goes through its own grief. We've talked about Frederick Bachman's um, A Man Called Ove. I've mentioned um, the two lives of Lydia Bird before, so there are all these different notions. I actually read a book recently called Notes About Your Sudden Disappearance by Alison Espa. Me uh, too. We read that, yes. and it, Again, I dove into it, not knowing what I was getting myself into, but it, I found it to be a really cathartic experience. The loss of a sister is very, very difficult, especially at a young age. And this was just a very interesting kind of dynamic of mining your way through it and the different ways that people in your life go through grief and how something might not impact you the way that it impacts somebody else or you know how how they feel about it and for me it was cathartic in in this 
in this way that, you know, I keep saying that grief is a very um, lonely existence. It's a very isolating existence and something that I'm currently experiencing. And so even though these characters aren't real, it was nice to know that I'm not the only one in isolation. Sometimes when you're in the thick of it, you can't, you can't see the light, right? So it was weird to feel that cathartic about it, but it was such a, a great book that I, I really enjoyed it. And it was just so different and nothing what I thought I was going to experience. I completely agree. I really enjoyed it. And I immediately texted you when I was maybe a, a quarter way in and thinking, and I said, oh my God, this must have been really hard for you. Yeah. Um, but I think there's a redemptive quality in, in that acknowledgement of this experience is as unique as you are and as unique as you and your sister's relationship is. But yeah. these 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 dynamics of loss and love and defining yourself and, and learning who you are after, after, without, and the way that memories shape and the way that loss shapes an entire family moving forward. Um, forever. I, I think it's, yeah, forever. Yeah. And it is a forever thing. And I think mm -hmm. it's something that, um, I, I thought it was just a, re it was really well told storytelling and, um, it's really coming of age. I mean, it sort of feels YA because she's so young looking at yeah. this big sister, but I, I thought it was very clever and surprising and, and, and full of depth and heart. I also found it to be not very like active. It's not like there's a huge plot point and, you know, there's, there's this huge buildup to this giant climax of a of a problem. Yes, a death is a problem, but it felt like there was a different kind of momentum versus like trying to peak at one area. It was ebbing and flowing very much like grief itself is an ebb and flow. So I, I thought yeah. that was really nice. And then yeah, very um, much character story. It's a character story and it is a quiet story. And it's it's um it's it's not for someone who needs like a wild plot, um, but it surprised me in its quiet nature. Yeah, and uh, I thought she, I thought I thought she did a great job. I really loved it. I I really liked it, and I listened to it as audiobook, as I'm sure you're shocked to hear. And was driving to work, and there was a little, a little moment where it like hit me pretty hard. And it's like wow, you know. And you texted me later that day and said this must have been a hard one for you, and I thought. It sure was <laughs> driving to work. <laughs> mm -hmm. Another one that I actually read before my sister's passing. Um, I've mentioned this book before. I think that she is not as well known as others have been in our past. Like we, you know, a lot of these authors we've heard before, right? But um, Kristen Bailey, "How Much Wine Will Fix My Broken Heart," is about it's a, you know, she writes book, she has a series about sisters and each book is about a different sister. There are five of them, I believe. And this particular sister lost her husband. He was fairly young and she was just reliving this whole life of, of grief. And he was fairly young and she goes through the stages of, you know, she's trying to find um, her way in the world. There's new love, there's old loves, there's, you know, just trying to maneuver through that and maneuver through having the existence of four sisters who are trying to lift her in, in their trying to get through it with her. But it's a humorous story. And Kristen Bailey is such a funny writer. She, and she's adorable on social media. She's in England and I, I adore her. And I think each sister has their own strengths and weaknesses. And there's just this, this funny scene about them getting on like a, a pirate ship kind of thing in the Harbor. And there's this whole thing and it was just very comical, but it was like, you know, grief is again, grief is not always super sad. You see these little moments. Like I have a digital picture frame with photos. My sister's friends had sent when she was alive and silly moments and you find the humor sometimes in it as well. So I love how she writes and just the different aspects of it. So is this the only, you, you've read multiple books of hers? Yes. I can't okay. recall. Um, oh, I, one of the other ones that I read recently was, um, am I allergic to men? <laughs> and that was, these that titles was are fantastic. That's yeah. For sure. And that was like, 
I think the youngest sister who um, had kind of an eclectic life. She was a, a character appearing at parties and things, and she gets hit by a car or a bus. She gets hit. She gets hit, and then she loses her memory, and the, her sisters are trying to help her regain her her memories and figure out who she is and what has happened with her life. So, oh, well, uh, I love, of course, always getting your perspective and in particular on this topic, as I was thinking about this book and, and, and setting up to talk to the author, I just, um, I think that sometimes, even though these are themes that people want to like, uh, especially when you're in, in, a, you're, you're often yeah. looking for the opposite emotion, but sometimes it really is comforting to see the difficult emotions reflected. I, you know, and there's something to be said about people who are going through something like this, that your friends and others who are not professionals don't know necessarily how to help you. There is no guidebook to grief and weird things will hit you in ways you didn't think about. And it's not logic. It's, it's heart, right? So being in that, it's a kind of a cathartic space. It's a, it's a therapeutic sense without being in therapy. It's a lot cheaper. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? As 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 the friend of or somebody in the sphere of somebody who um, is also trying to maybe understand yeah. the ups and the downs of this journey, a, a good writer will show kind of the 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 lack of formula and the lack of start and finish yeah. um, that comes with 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 real loss. And um, I'll just mention really quick, I just finished an audiobook. Uh, it all comes down to this, which is, and I would have said her name was Teresa, but it's Therese is how they said it in the audiobook. Therese Ann Fowler. And it is three sisters and their journey and all the chaos that's happening in their lives after their mom's passing. Yeah. Um, adult women and with all different things going on. And I found it very enjoyable. And it was also kind of a, a fairly quiet story, um, but dynamics that were very yeah. relatable. So it was kind of along my theme. Quiet and dynamic. That's yeah. a great description. Margaret, thank you so much for your book recommendations as always. And if you are listening to this podcast right now, I want to let everybody know that uh, we're also on YouTube and you should just click on for at least one second to see that Margaret looks like an absolute supermodel right now. Oh, well, thank you. The lighting really helps. It's the time of day. It's like golden hour Amazing. in this space. <laughs> also, Luminous. A little Wednesday vibe going on. <laughs> I'm all here for it. It's fantastic. She looks like she's kind of like zooming from an office in Paris. I oh. mean, it could be. Je suis enchanté. That's about all I know. <laughs> And do you know how to say goodbye? Means don't touch. Say again. Do you know how to say goodbye? Um, au revoir. Adieu. Au revoir. Adieu. With that, I say. No, I don't know. <laughs> but hold that pose. Let's hold that pose. She, she looks like a painting. Gorgeous. Thank you, Margaret. <laughs> and thanks, everybody, for listening. Keep reading. We'll check in with you next week. Thanks for listening to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast. I'm your host, Olivia Fierro. Our producer is Margaret Stewart. Our editor is Nick Sanchez. You can send us an email with your thoughts or your book recommendations. Olivia's Book Club at azfamily.com is the address. And you can check out Olivia's Book Club on Facebook or find us on Instagram. Hello, bookstagrammers, at olivias.bookclub. And Margaret is at overbooked and overdue. Make sure to rate and subscribe to this podcast and tell your friends. You can find us on Apple and Google Podcasts. Spotify, Stitcher, and Amazon Music.